Thomas äh, Sedlacek wurde nur zwei Wochen nach seiner Promotion an der Karls Universität in Prag im Jahr 2001 zum ökonomischen Berater des tschechischen Präsidenten Václav Havel berufen. Ist dann in die USA gegangen, hat an der Yale Universität ein Fellowship gemacht, hat dann auch dort gelehrt, ist dann zurückgekommen nach Europa und äh, wurde dann zum, zum Chef der, Tschechos der tschechoslowakischen Handelsbank AG berufen, die übrigens wirklich immer noch tschechoslowakische Handelsbank. Seit äh, 2009 ist er nun noch Mitglied des Nationalen Wissenschaftsrats in äh, Tschechien, äh, der, der speziell eigentlich für den Regierungschef zur Verfügung steht, sondern der lehrt an der Karls Universität insbesondere Wirtschaftsgeschichte. Im Thomas Sedlacek ist es Sedlacek oder Sedlacek, haben wir es vorher besprochen, äh, er hat gesagt, äh, es ist unter, in unterschiedlichen Zusammenhängen unterschiedlich und spielt insofern hier überhaupt keine Rolle. Also, das hat mich dann auch ratlos zurückgelassen, wie ich mit ihm umgehen soll. Ja. Gut. Äh, Thomas Sedlacek ist es gelungen, einen Bestseller zu schreiben. Diese Ökonomie von Gut und Böse ist in Tschechien äh, das erste Buch gewesen, was als nicht äh, fiktives Buch, also als Non-Fiction, in äh, die Bestsellerlisten gekommen ist. Und es ist so etwas wie eine radikale Kritik an der mathematisch-analytischen, scheinbar wertfreien Betrachtungsweise der modernen Volkswirtschaftslehre. So, we're looking forward. For your speech. So, thank you very much. From my experience, the cards never work. You have to switch up the microphone. <laughs> so, uh, so, so, thank you very much for having me at this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful castle, which I have never visited, and uh, that is something that I think I will have to have to remedy. But let's go directly into the topic. Uh, because, of course, the time is short. <clears throat> the traditional thinking has it that the opposite of, of good is evil. Uh, you know, this is quite contrary. Now, of course, in the little fringes of our thinking, perhaps we can also entertain the thought that the opposite of good isn't evil, but the opposite of good is the idea of better. <laughs> Now, if you think about it, that gives a lot of twist to the plot. Um, let's start with one of the basic, let's say, archetypes of our, of our civilization, which is the, the Hebrew myth or the Hebrew story about the Garden of Eden. Now, the Garden of Eden was very nice. Uh, people didn't have to work a lot. Uh, there was only one woman, which I think is, uh, that's the easy, uh, e easy case. Um, so no problems, but Adam and Eve wanted it better, uh, as if the real wasn't real enough. One of the things that must have been going through their heads is, is this all there is to, to, to the creation? Is, that, is this it? This is perhaps boring, this is perhaps not good enough. So Adam and Eve tried to improve it with uh, tasting from the tree of, of knowledge. Listen, very often we think that it's the tree of good and evil, but no, it was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So they wanted to have um, uh, an increase in, 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 in knowledge. And this myth or this story that we know from the Bible is repeated from almost all the cultures that we know of. In the beginning, everything was nice and cool, and we had what we call a stationary state. You didn't have to improve the paradise because it already was paradise. And then um, intrudes an idea, you can see this in the Greek mythology about the story of Pandora, when, when um, you know, fire gets introduced and, and techni as sort of uh, technology was introduced and people lost their, their, um, their inner peace. Now, we human beings seem to be quite strange when it comes to uh, paradises. We try everything we can to get into a mental paradise or let's say political or ecological or in any other meaning of the word of, of paradise. Once we get there, we try everything we can to get out of it. And uh, this sort of a circle of, of, uh, of, of discontent continues even in the most perfect, uh, perfect of, 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 of stages. Even when Adam was freshly created, there was nothing wrong with him, everything was good, good, good. Uh, he felt lonely, 
he wanted um, a companion. And then when he had one, they always sort of wanted more. So the, uh, the desire to have more, the sort of a discontent that drives the economy, or even maybe humanity, till today is not a result of the fall, as it is often interpreted in traditional theology, but it is a feat or feature that, at least according to these <clears throat> stories, we already had even before uh, sin entered the world. So, how does this relate to the world of 2013? Well, um, your topic today is burnout um, and, and, and slowdown. So I will start um, with today, and then I will again go back into the old ways of, 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 of teaching or thinking about the topic of, of, um, of uh, rest versus some sort of unrest. Now, um, the, uh, the classical, let's say, the classical way that we treat the current situation today, and this is what you hear from economists, this is what you hear from journalists, this is what you hear from intellectuals, this is what you hear from politicians, is the diagnosis of the state of, let's say, the Western world is that the Western world is depressed. We are in a depression. Now this is entering the medical terminology. Depression is a um, uh, psychiatric or, or psychological language we speak. Now, um, I, I would disagree. I don't think the proper diagnosis is that our society or the economy is depressed. A uh, much more accurate way of, of putting the diagnosis is that we suffer not from depressions, but we suffer from manic depressions. And that's a huge difference. Uh, to a depressed person, you give antidepressants. So, translating that into the language of economics, when the economy is depressed, you feed it with budget deficits, you uh, decrease the interest rate in order to pretend, uh, well, no, in order to put more energy into the, into the uh, economy. How this is done, I'm, I'm very happy to go into later in the debate. When you treat a depressed patient, when he or she regains her happy moods back, this is good news and the treatment can be slowly considered to maybe, you know, uh, to withdraw the treatment. If, however, you are dealing with a manic depressive patient, the fact that he or she is getting her good moods back is not good news, per se, because, of course, the reversal into manias happen. Now, um, a lot of people think that our problem are the depressions. Manias are as problematic as, as depressions and it is, I would even say today that it is the manias that have caused, uh, uh, that are more dangerous than, 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 the, than, than the slower uh, or the depressed times. Why? Well, you know, the crises did not start uh, in Europe contrary to the common belief. It started in America, where they don't use Euro, by the way. And then the first country that caught it from the United States was Great Britain, where also they don't use Euro. But anyway, that's, um, that's a different, different um, topic. It didn't go like this. First, the economy did not slow down. The unemployment did not go up. The normal sort of, a, sort of a explanation to fit what we hear today is the economy slowed down, competitiveness went down, unemployment went up, and then the crisis <coughs> happened. No, it was exactly the other way around. The United States of America was enjoying extremely high levels of growth for a very long period of time. They had extremely low uh, um, uh, amounts of unemployment, and also American competitiveness was, was, was improving. That's when we had not a, um, a cloud, so to speak, in the macroeconomic sky of, of America and also later on here in Europe. That's exactly the moment when the crisis happened. So it was what I call a full throttle bankruptcy. Everything was full speed, everything was fine, and then we hit the wall. 
It was, um, it was a manic-driven depression. Now, then, if we're trying to come up with a cure, the cure is not try to speed it up. The cure is not try to increase your efficiency. The cure is not let's try and, you know, I, 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 partake, I, I partake very frequently in these debates, most often with business people. And uh, what I hear from these debates is basically give us back our, our manias. We pray to the gods of growth, or however, we want it again. We want, again, these high levels of growth, low levels of unemployment, etc., etc. Um, if you focus your treatment only on the depressed part, it's like treating an alcoholic with removing his or her hangover. <coughs> you know, hangover is not the problem, although, of course, when you wake up in the morning, it seems like this is the problem, but the problem is not the hangover, the problem is the excessive usage of alcohol and other drugs, um, uh, depends on the country, uh, uh, <laughs> the night before. And even if you come up with a silver, silver bullet for removing uh, hangovers, you have not removed the root, the root of the problem. Now, let's go back or, or come back with me four or five thousand years back and let's see uh, the very first business cycle or the first economic depression in the recorded history of mankind. We now are dealing with the most recent crisis. Let's have a look on how this was dealt with uh, for the first time in, in, in literature of, of our Western culture. Do, do you think you can recall the first recorded business cycle in, uh, in our culture? Joseph, very good, yes. This is Genesis 42, I think. The number 42 will come, come back again because it's my favorite number. Those of you who've read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy know exactly what I'm talking about. And, 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 and I, I explain that in, in slow motion later. But, you know, this is the very famous story about the seven, the dream that, you know, Joseph, I'm sorry, Pharaoh had this dream about seven fat cows and seven lean cows. Uh, and he didn't know what to, what to make of it, so he calls Joseph, and Joseph explains and says, you know, congratulations, Pharaoh. You just had the first macroeconomic um, prediction in the history of mankind 14 years ahead of time, which is much better than what we are capable of in the year 2013. We usually get one or two years wrong, and uh, then they got, you know, 14 years pretty much right. And uh, the, the, the cure was exactly correct. The first address was slow down the, the fat years. In other words, do not consume everything that grows, but, and this I know is almost a perverse word, save one-fifth of, of what you have. You know the story, they managed to go, Egyptians managed to survive a much much more drastic and much more radical and much more deadly uh, uh, economic crises without a single penny of debt. Which is quite interesting because today the, the zone of, 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 of medicine in which we move our debate is exactly deficit. And the only question is how much of it? Should we go 3% or should we go 5%? Should we go zero? This is sort of the Mansonelle that we are, we are moving in. But, again, four or five thousand years back, they didn't need to borrow a single penny. Exactly because they saved or recuperated some energy during the, during the, the good years, they could use that without any external help uh, uh, to, uh, to then elevate the hardships. During the, um, during, during the hard times. So, um, um, this to me seems to be something, something crucial. You will find that the debate that we have today, basically I would say in, in Germany, which is a country that now leads in this, 
is uh, a debate on how to get rid of, uh, of, of, of the depression, but very little, if any, debate is how to get rid of the manias. Now, of course, if, you, if you're dealing with a manic depressive patient, all of them enjoy their manic periods. And you don't give antidepressants <laughs> to a bipolar um, or patient with a bipolar disorder. You give them mood stabilizers. And many of these patients um, don't like to take these medications because they spo these medications spoil their good mood uh, during the manic times, which is exactly what these medicines are supposed to do. <laughs> Coming again to the alcohol analogy, because I come from Czech Republic and I hope that <laughs> I will be well understood also here in, in, in Austria. Um, uh, it is very easy to regulate or self-regulate yourself on Saturday morning. You know, when you wake up with a hangover, you usually come to very quick conclusions, such as, I will never drink again, <laughs> not in that bar, not with Joe, <laughs> and not that combination of, of alcohol. And during the Saturday morning, you seem to be very much resolved, and you are very, I mean, you don't even want to drink alcohol on, on Saturday morning, unlike the other mornings. But um, my question is, of course, today we are in a situation of a Saturday morning, we have this hangover, it's easy to come up with with self-regulations and all of these sort of promises. My question is, what will happen on the next Friday evening? And I don't know about you, but most um, alcoholics that I have talked to, um, uh, you know, find themselves at the very same bar, drinking the same mixture of drinks with John again. And how exactly to come up with that regulation, that to me is the, um, is the, is the name of the game. So it isn't really a, a GDP slowdown that destroyed us, but it was uh, the radical uh, GDP growth that caused almost a collapse, or in some countries a collapse, but almost a collapse of even the uh, sort of the average. European um, economy. Not the slow, but the fast. Um, this to me is uh, exactly coming back to the beginning of my speech, the idea of, of, of better. Now rest assured that better is something that's absolutely unattainable. A lot of people come to me and ask me, so is it going to be better? You know, and I, I hate this question, but just to get rid of, uh, rid of the people, I said, I don't think it's going to get better, I think it's going to be good. And good is good, and it doesn't necessarily have to be, have to be better. In the beginning, when economics as a science or as a field, I don't think we can use the word <coughs> science, um, was, was, was sort of introduced, uh, one of the key topics that economists focus was the idea of the steady state. So the question was, where will the economy lead us? To what situation will it uh, converge to? And they paid very little attention to the, the growth period, and they paid a lot of attention to the convergence point, if you will. Will it be a just society, or will it be a society of extremely rich people? very few extremely rich people, and a majority of poor people. This is the conclusion that Thomas Malthus, for example, arrived at. That it is inevitable, uh, the, the, the logic of the system in, under which we live will always lead to sort of a um, diversification of few very rich people and a vast majority of people living on substance, uh, you know, um, substance uh, level just barely enough to sustain themselves. Uh, Adam Smith was asking the question, John Stuart Mill was asking the question, um, Schumpeter, who was from here, um, uh, was also very famously asking the question, where will this lead to? None of them really engaged much of their energies into 2-3% GDP growth in the next two years, but the key topic was 
um, uh, how will the steady state look like? One of the last economists that took upon that, that, that took this question was was John Stuart, I mean, uh, John Maynard Keynes. In his uh, economic possibilities of our grandchildren, he believed, and he again is using very religious language here. About 80 years ago, he had a speech uh, which became very famous called the "Grand Possibility of uh, the Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren," in which he says, "You know, 100 years from now, which is." soon, we will be rich enough, we will be affluent enough, so that we will no longer care for the economic economists and the economic will no longer lead the society, but they will just be maintenance people. So if I'm allowed to use the analogy of building a building, uh, economists are now the architects. If the building is not built, you need an architect who will sort of put beauty and the statistics, I mean, the, the, the statics and everything of the building together. Once the building is built, you no longer need um, architects, you only need maintenance people to strengthen the roof when snow falls and, and you know, when there is a leak in the, in the heating, an economist will come and fix it. But he or she will no longer play the role of the priest, so to speak, who guides us into the, into the future. Which brings me to the next topic, and that is the very question, who will lead us into the, into the future? And I think quite collectively today we believe in something that I call the unorchestrated orchestrator. You are not allowed to orchestrate it, the markets. The markets will orchestrate you. This is the, uh, the mantra of, the, of, of, of sort of the hardcore economics. It's laissez-faire, laissez-passe. I mean, the very irony that this is a French phrase should already sort of, you know, have your bells ringing. But, um, don't touch it, let it be, let it work. It will touch you, it will work you. Don't give it values, it will give values of your work and of your personal life and everything back to you. It will tell you that milk is cheaper than Coke, it will tell you uh, the value of things, but you are not in any way allowed to um, allowed to meddle. So the economics is normative backwards. There's been this huge debate among theoretical economists whether economics can be a, a, positive, a positive science, meaning that it should be physics-like, opinions um, dis, disregarded. <laughs> You're not supposed to put any values into your uh, economic judgments. Now, this is a curious debate, of course, but this was something that, um, that uh, Milton Friedman coined. He wrote a very famous essay, I think known to those of you who, who, who devoted a little bit of time to, to, to economics, called Economics as a Positive Science, in which he says economics should be a positive, value-free science, which, of course, is a normative statement. You know, he's not describing economics as it is. You don't hear people from theoretical physics saying, you know, physics should be a positive science because it is. So, you know, uh, Milton Friedman here gave away a couple of very important sort of clues. First, economics is not a positive science. If it would be, this article would be redundant. And secondly, he put a very strong value statement of his own saying that I believe economics should be, which again is a normative statement, should be something that, is, that it isn't. Uh, so in other words, in this, economics has taken uh, sort of the, the, the role of a religion, wanting to sort of evangelize, um, evangelize us into more of the same. This is the topic that I'm spending a lot of time thinking about, um, and that's the whole idea of, of, of fetish. Fetish is something that promises you the way to inner peace, the way even to salvation. It promises to close the circle of you. This is the most, this is the biggest topic of pop music. I am not myself, but I want to be. And either there's a woman involved, I cannot be without you, you've changed my life, da di da di da. Uh, I want to be real. This is a huge topic of Freddie Mercury, you know, this whole idea of the, of the clown. I want to be free, uh, but something is obstructing me from being, being myself. There's a gap between myself and myself, 
that needs to be breached, <clears throat> which is a huge theological topic um, and philosophical topic and also an, an economical topic. So uh, when we don't feel content, when we don't feel ourselves, we look for things that will make us real, that will make us our, ourselves. And what has stepped in today is the idea of, of, of the economic. Little bit more of growth and then we will finally be ourselves. Now, uh, uh, when you, so okay, let's give, couple of examples just to make sure because my understanding of fetish is a little bit different from, from, from the common usage. Um, 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 fetish is something that, that uh, promises you the way to completion but at the same time it blocks it. Um, and you have a love-hate relationship towards your fetish and the more you are bound with the fetish the more you dive into it. Okay, example. Um, let's, uh, for example, okay, let's take the, the very obvious sort of sexual interpretation, Whitney Houston and the movie Bodyguard. Okay, there is this pervert who cannot score the femina. He wants to very much, but of course, she runs away all the time. So he takes a piece of her cloth, mortalizes her, and finds that piece of her cloth, the fetish, a safe gate anytime he wants to access the fantasy of making love to her or having her at his disposal, he uses this piece of, piece of cloth. He loves it and at the same time he hates it because he knows exactly this thing that blocks, uh, blocks him from accessing her. Let's take a, a, a little bit more specific example and that is a fetish that we Europeans indulged in to generate two, three generations ago, and that was the fetish of geographical growth. Two, three generations ago, we, for some reason that nobody understands today, we wanted to have big areas of countries. Uh, and it was exact, oh, this is actually interesting. So, for example, we Czechs wanted to get rid of this uh, uh, Austrian empire. It was the cage of nations, you, uh, your, your father's father's father's, took the liberty from us. We could never be ourselves unless we had our own nation state. So this was what we thought would make us ourselves, true Czechs, but it almost killed us. This is the very famous American, don't ask what the country can do for you, ask what you can do for the country. So we as Europeans indulged in this fetish of not economic growth, but geographical growth. The idea was it will set you free, but at the end of the day, it literally killed you on the front fighting a guy that you would probably like if you met him in the bar. Another fetish is an interesting fetish. I will, I will, uh, it's, it's a sort of a theological fetish, and that is the fetish of Pharisees. Pharisees fetishized the idea of ethics. Again, you don't feel direct access to God, or today perhaps uh, to yourself, you, in order to breach, breach the gap, you must follow more stringent ethical rules. And then, exactly these rules became the stumbling block to, to the excess. This, is, this was the main message of Jesus, is you have fetishized ethics. It was supposed to be for human beings, but this is something that, that Human beings are not for the law, the law is for human beings. It is something that, that, that actually drowns you. And the more discontent, the more, feel you, 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 the more you feel the gap, the more ethical rules you pile up on each other until it becomes completely ridiculous. Now, coming back to economics, what Jesus had to say against the Pharisees is quite similar to what today, let's simplify this, the Occupy movement has to say against the economics. First, you pretend these rules are natural or even God-given, while in fact you made them up last Friday during the dinner at Joe's bar. This is the idea that we get quite a lot from, uh, from, uh, from the body of economics. The, uh, the economics left on its own is natural. While it isn't natural, it is absolutely artificial. Let me just demonstrate 
um, demonstrate what I mean. It is, it is, you will know him, but he's not very much known outside of Austria. Uh, Ivan Ilyich, a great um, uh, philosopher that comes from here, had an interesting observation. He said, for a, for a person who was born in the city, he or she has never seen or touched anything natural. Look around you just today, everything you touch, everything you feel, is made by human beings for human beings. Even the trees in the city are there because some authority decided that they would look good there. They're not natural. And you cannot really cure this having a two-month trip to, to India when you want to meet the real, the natural, because you still are a tourist in India with a nice little credit card. Um, it's, 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 it's an adventure for you. So the first point is nothing really in our world of us is natural. Everything is human made. It seems really natural for us to use cell phones, for us to use paper, for us to use chairs, but these things are not natural. They're made for human beings by human beings. Why then do we have this stringent belief that the invisible hand of the market is the very natural self? A little bit I think I can uh, make uh, a bridge to the whole idea of democracy and then talk about the relationship between democracy and, and growth. Democracy is not natural. It is the best system we have, but it's not natural. If you look on the history of just Europe, forget about the rest of the world for a while, we had, as Europeans, we had democracy only a couple of percentage of the time space. Um, we had a little bit of democracy in a couple of Greek, Greek villages. Today, these cities would be more villages than cities. Then for thousands of years, not a hint of democracy. And now, let's say, past 200 years in some countries, sometimes. My point is, of course, democracy is the best system we have, but we have to care for it. It is not natural. It is not a default, automatic situation. If you let go of the steering wheel, it will not drive into democracy. Um, and the same goes for the market. You cannot let go of the wheel thinking, okay, I will let it value-free, neutral. Then you shouldn't be surprised that you end up in places where you go like, huh? How did we end up here? Well, nobody was steering the wheel. If we really believe that economics is so natural. So, just like politics, or just like democracy, it dies if you don't care for it. This is a beautiful song from, from you too. Love, uh, how does it go? Um, it dies if you, don't, if, you don't, if you don't care for it. In the same way, we must nurture and care for, for our markets, otherwise they, they, they sum up. Uh, how much time do I have? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, perfect. So let me... Yeah. Yellow card, okay. So I am the only one who invokes a yellow card upon himself. <laughs> um, uh, now, this is a curious thing. You know, I come from Czech Republic. Of course, you know that uh, 23 years ago we were um, you know, socialist, communist, whatever. Um, and during the 1989, we had a very difficult choice. We could upgrade, or we were upgrading, to a system called capitalism, which made you free, you could speak your mind, you could travel, you could, you could, you could, you know, do whatever you wanted to do, but the disadvantage was it also makes you richer. So, of course, you know, this was no dilemma. We buy it, obviously. My question is, what if the dilemma was real? What if you could choose a system that could make you free, da 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 da, -da but it made you poorer. This is the core, uh, the core question. You will say this is unrelated, this is back in the past, but no, look at, uh, um, and I, by the way, you are here talking to the biggest Europhil in the Czech Republic, which isn't all that difficult. Um, <laughs> but one of the founding documents of the European, uh, uh, the European Union is Growth and Stability Pact. So, of course, again, no-brainer, growth and stability, yeah. What if the choice was real, growth or stability? Now, that is a true dilemma worthy of your time, because otherwise, do you want a chocolate, chocolate ice cream or vanilla ice cream or both? 
again, you don't really have to be much of a philosopher here. So what if the choice is growth or stability? And which one would we choose? And this is precisely, I think, what have we done wrong as the West. We've been selling stability in order to buy growth. And the result is, um, uh, as you can see, and I again come back to the beginning of my talk, very fast growing economies, extremely unstable. Um, you know, isn't the role of today to exactly reverse the, the let's say, the, the pecking order and start selling growth whenever it comes back, if it comes back, in order to buy stability. The most simple case here is, is the whole idea of debt. We have been indebting our economies for one reason only, and that is to attain higher levels of growth. There was no other uh, reason behind that. By that, we made our economies extremely fast growing and also extremely unstable. Um, unstable to the point that you, uh, you come to the situation of what I call subject-object reversal. Uh, in the beginning it looks like you are in control, then something goes wrong, subject-object place, uh, swap places, and you become the slave of something that you thought you controlled. Which is exactly what happened with us as Europeans or as the Western civilization when it comes to debt. In the beginning, we thought we could control this, this will make us stronger, da di da di da Then something went wrong, it doesn't really matter what. Now we have effectively become the slaves of debt. It is the rating agencies that tell France today what to do. And Sarkozy was complaining about this in one of his philosophical moments. He um, said, you know, I am a president, democratically elected president of France. How come these 12 people from Moody's, I mean, that, that's also a given. Moody's or, or Fitch, um, they are effectively dictating to me what I must do, otherwise they'll decrease the rating and the, and the country goes, goes bust. He should have continued. If France had zero level of debt, these rating agencies could be doing whatever they want to, it wouldn't matter. Um, so this object-subject reversal, which I'm very happy to come again in the debate, but don't want to focus much on that, is exactly what happened in the relationship of democracy, I claim, and, and growth. In the beginning, I believe, and I still believe this, but I think I am now become a, major, a minority that, uh, let's say, I don't know how to call the system under which we live, but let me just call it uh, uh, democratic capitalism for lack of a better word. Um, I believed, and I still believe, that democratic capitalism is a fertile ground for growth. When it comes, hallelujah, fine. When it doesn't, good. Okay. It is a, uh, a benefit, a plus. What I fear has happened in the last generation or two is a subject-object reversal today we effectively believe, I, I claim, that growth is a conditio sine qua non of market democracy. In other words, deprive us of growth and the whole superstructure, markets and democracy, collapses. So we believe today, effectively, that markets cannot function without growth. And even we believe that democracies cannot function without growth. This is the Greek case. Talking about the Greek case, um, you know, a lot of people say in between the lines, because everybody wants to be politically correct, which is nice, but in between the lines, what you really get is, you know, a, a, you know the Greeks are lazy. If only they worked twice as much as they do, they wouldn't have a problem. If only they worked twice as efficiently, paid their taxes twice as efficiently, followed the rules of textbooks twice as efficiently, they wouldn't have a problem. I disagree with this analysis, but just for the moment, let's accept it for the sake of the argument. And let's take the same funicular and let's, uh, sorry, the same, uh, same view, and let's take a look on, on Ireland. Isn't there the case exactly opposite? 
If the Irish, especially bankers, worked half the time and half as efficiently, they wouldn't have a problem. <laughs> and this to me is the root of, of, of the problem, so to speak. Everybody knows the solution to the Greek problem. Everybody here in this room knows exactly uh, the solution. You know, you don't really have to... That's an easy case. What's difficult is how to implement it in democracy. This was, I will not quote his name because he's still alive, but it was a Dutch politician who said, you know, a lot of people think that we politicians are, are stupid, we don't know what to do. No, we, we know exactly what to do. What we don't know is how to be re-elected after doing it. <laughs> and, uh, and, and this is sort of, in a nutshell, the Greek problem. Everybody knows what to do, but we don't know how to precisely sort of smuggle it through uh, the, <clears throat> the instruments of, of, of democracy. <clears throat> uh, it is precisely uh, the Irish case that resembles the American problem, the Icelandic problem, a little bit of the Hungarian problem, a little bit of the, uh, even the Spanish and, and the Portugal problem. That to me is the root of, of the problem, not the Greek, not the, intellectually speaking, of course not politically, but intellectually speaking, that is the tough nut to crack. Again, Ireland being the Friday evening, uh, Greece being the, the, the Saturday morning. And let me, let me leave you with one last comment here, so maybe we allow some more time for debate, which I always enjoy more. The whole idea of, 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 of better, you know. <clears throat> I discovered this when I was uh, making myself a vodka lime. You know, if you want your toilet detergent to be perfect, and smell exactly like freshly squeezed lime juice, you must not be surprised when your freshly squeezed lime juice smells like toilet detergent. Thank you very much.